Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first Close Looking at a Distance program here at the Cleveland Museum of Art. I'm Kijo Lee, Assistant Director of Academic Affairs, and I'm so excited to welcome you today. So we're going to start in a moment and wait, uh, and wait for additional guests to log in. But in the meantime, please familiarize yourself with the Q&A interface to the right of your screen. Um, as we will be asking you questions over the course of the program. You can also use this platform to ask any questions or make comments at any time during the program, and your responses will help to guide our looking over this 30 minutes. Feel free to include your name or to remain anonymous. We'll use the uh, the Q&A also to post links to artworks that are in the CMA's collections online and any additional information or useful resources. So one of the most popular and most missed aspects of the museum are the daily tours and regular close looking sessions that allow visitors to learn from experts inside the galleries about the ideas, histories, and techniques each artwork carries with it. In Close Looking at a Distance, we're taking that experience virtual and connecting it to Desktop Dialogues, a program run by my colleague, Andrew Capetta, who's joining me today. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Kijo. Great to, great to see you. Great to have you. Um, so uh, Andrew is the manager of collection and exhibition programs, and both of these programs, Desktop Dialogues and Close Looking at a Distance, are meant to um, <clears throat> uncover new, alternate, and often unrecognized histories that are perhaps unknown, but incredibly relevant to our own moment. In Close Looking at a Distance, essentially what we ask is, how can we sharpen our perceptions and catalog our impressions of artworks so that we can ask the kinds of questions that lead us to the more hidden histories and narratives um, that might not be revealed at first sight? What are your thoughts, Andrew? Yeah, I, I really um, uh, think it's, it's a great opportunity to, as you said, like gather together looking, uh, to look at an object or look at a set of objects. That's something we're missing right now. And I feel like there's um, a lot that can be gained from that experience, that um, people sharing their insights openly with one another um, and sharing different insights, right? You can, I think, then develop an understanding of how others might see differently and develop respect for and understand the points of view of others. And I think that's a really, a really important thing that we need right now. Absolutely. And so while Andrew and I won't always be together every week um, for these programs, those the programs will be linked either thematically through an object or through the questions that we might be asking. For instance, last week we discussed uh, artwork by Fred Wilson called To Die Upon a Kiss, which was an object that made both of us see the museum and several other artworks very differently. So this week we'll continue to think about how a single artwork can drive us to question differently other artworks that have been on our minds. And so we start with this wonderful eye pin. Great. And so on social media, we asked viewers to note the very first question or thought that they had um, when they first saw this work. And we got some pretty amazing responses. We got a few jokes, like someone decided uh, to say they were so glad that someone decided to broach the subject. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Um, and we got other guesses about what the object itself might be. We, um, and then we had questions like, is it a man's eye or a woman's eye? Who is, whose eye is it exactly? And for those of you who didn't have the opportunity to do so on social media, please feel free to post your initial impressions or your first questions in the Q&A. What about you, Andrew? What's the first question that came to mind when you saw this artwork? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna share my, my questions, of course, but I, I know we're eager to hear from all of you, so please ask questions away, but I'll, I'll share mine, uh, so to, in a way, get it going. <laughs> um, I was really interested, and I'm, I'm actually looking at right, right now in my, uh, I'm fortunate to have two screens, so I'm looking at another screen here with the object on it, and, um, you know, every time I look at it, I'm really curious about how it was made, um, you know, looking closely and making, make, maybe making some educated guesses about process, but I kind of want to know process that were involved in depicting the eye specifically, um, and also in what sequence things happened, right? 
um, was the eye depicted on a kind of a particular surface, and then that was put inside this sort of brooch, or was the surface put inside the brooch and then painted, which, as I say it, um, might be kind of hard <laughs> as I look at it. I'm realizing, you know, there are other things going on here. But this is what happens when you look, right? You realize that, you know, some of your questions. So that's a lot of questions. Sorry, but those are my. Nope. It's all about process. No need to apologize. It is. It's like one question begets another begets another. So we've gotten two questions or comments so far. Two questions. One is um, from Anonymous saying, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, question mark. So thinking that perhaps it's uh, thinking about the content, maybe the, the idea behind this single eye is the idea that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, whomever this eye of beholding or however um, um, that works. Uh, and then what are the gemstones and do they have a meaning? So thinking about not only the artwork that we see inside of the pin, but do the stones themselves have um, a particular meaning, which is a really interesting question. So I want to sort of think about these two things together, the content and the and the um, holder, as it were, um, uh, uh, or the frame um, um, for the eye. And so as we're looking at this, we've gotten a pretty close up shot. Um, and our um, uh, entry for this object does not say exactly what these stones are. And so I'm not exactly certain what they are. It's a question that I'll definitely need to ask conservation. I was thinking that because they're so dark that they could be onyx, but then there's also mm -hmm. garnet stones that can appear quite that, like can be so red that they're that way, that they appear black. So that would be a really interesting question. But I think that the style of this pin, the way that it's circled by these rather large stones, I think lets us know that this is a precious object in some ways. Um, um, not knowing yet if this is precious or semi-precious stone, which would tell us more maybe about the status of whomever might have owned this. Um, but thinking about eye, is beauty in the eye of the beholder, I don't know, what are you thinking, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, I'm still thinking about the gemstones, but I, I, uh, in terms of like, I'm thinking of the, the style of the time, you know, when certain gemstones were popular. I mean, I know there's certain symbolism depending. It's a great question. And I'm really, it's, it's something that I haven't thought about yet. So thank you, Joanne, for bringing that up. Um, it's, it's a great avenue, right? There's so many ways we could interpret that and we could we could bring a new meaning, right? Through, through that analysis. Um, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, that makes me think of the questions about who, you know, about ownership and who, you know, who, who, who is wearing this, you know, who's beholding it and, and these sort of things. So those kinds of questions of, of who would have owned it, I think are kind of interesting to me. Yeah, and I want to pick back up because Joanne, jo, Joanne also said that perhaps it's jet, so perhaps it's mourning jewelry. And we'll talk a little bit more about what these kinds of pieces mm -hmm. might have indicated as we're moving forward. Um, another anonymous entry is it seems to represent an expression, maybe a thoughtfulness. So one's eye, right? We think of eye and the beauty of the beholder, but we also sometimes think that someone's character can be found in their eyes. Um, uh, and these sort of fragments, right? What do they mean to have just a single eye in that? Yeah. In that, yeah. Uh, so I'm thinking about like how the eyes is often an important part of any portrait. Like that's the means of, um, you know, engagement, the avenue of connection with the viewer. Um, so it's kind of interesting that we're just looking at an eye. Yeah. Oh, so Grace has asked if they, if this was taken from a larger painting and recycled into this piece, which is, yes. <laughs> I am going to ask um, the, our audience, what do you think? Do you think that this was taken from a larger portrait or not? Just guess. What do you think, Andrew? Um, I actually, it's interesting, uh, Grace, I had this very same question, um, really, like, and actually it, it prompted a sort of an avenue of investigation, right, for me. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and it, it, so, like, I thought it was so unusual that there would be this I and only an I um, 
it looks like a fragment to me of a, a smaller portrait or something mm. like that. And I was kind of, you know, thinking it was so modern to have it sort of isolated um, in this way. Absolutely. And that was something that was particularly curious to me. Yeah. I mean, I do know a little bit more about this, so I can tell you that it was not from a, from a separate whole portrait. And if we think about how tiny this eye is in diameter, to even cut it out of a portrait, to think about what the proportion of that portrait would have to be in order to cut this out. But these kinds mm -hmm. of single eye um, paintings are not unheard of in the history of portrait miniatures. And it would have been created separate on its own disc of ivory, separate from the jewelry and probably made by two different artists. So the, the jewelry maker um, is a particular kind of um, artistry and then the painting. And so it was likely that this was um, a commissioned object and then the artist and the jeweler come together to uh, consider how these things might, might fit. What is the sentiment? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, um, and I think it connects to we have um, from another um, anonymous uh, commenter: um, Is the eye a representation of the wearer to look at or express something the wearer wouldn't be socially able to, or possibly like a portal for the wearer to see the eye of another? And what I will say, Anonymous, is a ding, ding, ding. <laughs> um, I, I want us to talk a bit more about that. But first, I know, um, Andrew, that you mentioned that this feels very modern to you. Can you say a little bit more about that? And then we're going to take that and think about um, uh, what this is representing for the way, for the way of Yeah, it. totally. And, and I'm also thinking earlier about, you know, how we see in, in our particular lenses. And I, I have an interest in 20th century and contemporary art. I study that. So um, um, I, when I see isolation of a, of a body part in a way, I think immediately of, of surrealism, the, the art movement, that global art movement. Uh, and one of their interests was uh, reimagining the human body, um, you know, producing images of that body in really unusual ways or some of those images were about isolating and really focusing on certain body parts. Um, and there was a particular interest in this, uh, this realist had in the eye, especially yeah. as like a, yeah. as like a, a, a to, I can use that word portal, right? A portal of like desire, right? Objectifying somebody looking at them. And that's how, you know, it's, so it's like a, an organ that's associated with sexuality uh, specifically. And we actually have a, a work by an artist who was associated with the surrealist, uh, Louise Bourgeois. She sort of, you know, came to sort of tail end, but took a lot of those ideas and brought them, uh, kind of reinvented them, I'd say. Um, and this print um, that we're looking at is of eyes, multiple eyes, right? Mm. Um, that are sort of across this sort of image. And when I, when I look at this print, I'm, I'm thinking of, right, she's maybe thinking through as being as a woman artist who's often, a, or as a woman in society, in European and then American society, I am looked at, right? And instead she kind of uh, makes an object that looks back, right? <laughs> in, in a way, and sort of taking control. And, I, and I'm, maybe I'm extrapolating a lot, but I'm kind of wondering if, if, the, if the wearer of this is doing the same thing in some ways, right? Um, yeah. In a lot of ways, yeah. I think there's like an empowerment there. Yes, I mean, I think that this is a really apt comparison in thinking about, even though this uh, miniature of the eye that we've been talking about was made in the 1900s and the Louise Bourgeois was made much later, there is a connection in thinking about what is this eye gazing outward? Um, and I think it also connects to um, what Catherine Burke has asked, which said, which is, it seems like someone is giving a side eye. I wonder where it would be worn if it was on the chest. It almost looks like a window inside a person's heart. And in mm -hmm. fact, um, if we can go back to the eye pin briefly, um, I just want to say that, yes, it is in fact part of a tradition. This 1900s pin is part of a tradition that goes all the way back to the 18th century, where the mystery of the sitter allowed for a bold display of undercover clandestine love affairs. So I'm going to quote um, a, a specialist in 18th century art, Alison Meyer, who says, 
While miniature portraits were already popular in 18th century England, they were often private objects viewed solely by the wearer. So the kind of closed portraits that would have been tucked into a lapel or um, into a pocket or carried uh, along with one. Um, yet an eye portrait could be worn boldly on a bracelet, ring, stick pin, pendant, or brooch with the identity of the subject a mystery. And I also want to add the point that this pin that we're looking at is I think about an inch and a half in diameter, so really, really small, um, and could have been worn, you know, on one's chest. It could have, but it also could have been worn, um, uh, as we can see, if we uh, put up a slide of the other examples of eyes that we have in our collection, they would be in various types of jewelry, could also be on a bracelet, and it was a way for lovers to demonstrate to each other only, right? So it was, um, they might com commission their own eye to give to a lover or mm -hmm. commission a portrait of their lover's eye to carry with them always. So there's absolutely that connection, that idea of sensuality, the idea of the eye standing in not only for the entire body, but also for um, the actual gaze that one wishes they could display in public but cannot. Um, oh, we have some great, um, I'm just looking at these comments are really sort of fantastic <laughs> and it looks like we have some good, you know, people really participating um, in, in the conversation here. There's an anonymous viewer that says, I find it interesting to consider the eye as a means of identifying emotion, considering this time of mask wearing, where mm -hmm. one can only view one's emotions through the eyes, right? That's a really, I'm going to like that. That's really great. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, they're all really fantastic. Kito, I, I, I know there's like, you know, tons of comments coming in, which we'll get to, but what is your, um, what is your first question? I know, you know, I know this, uh, you know, we're getting a sense of how maybe um, you know about these objects, but when you mm -hmm. first approach them, right, what are yes. the questions, questions that you have? So my immediate question was, when was this made? Simply because I've studied a lot of 19th century portrait miniatures, and these are not objects that I've come across at all. Although I have come across other miniatures that are fragmentary in this way or similar ways, and I'm a little bit obsessed with such things. So immediately brought to mind two um, examples from my own research and thinking and, and um, uh, that I think we're gonna put up. Um, one called Beauty Revealed, the other called Rose Prentice. So Beauty Revealed is on the left, Rose Prentice is on the right. So I am, um, sorry, uh, I have the exact dimensions of that brooch. They are three of three eighths of an inch by seven eighteenths of an inch. So even less, right? Um, uh, uh, so very, very tiny. Thanks for bearing with me as I adjust my screen. So when we're looking at these two very distinct paintings, I'm going to ask the audience and you, Andrew, what do you mm -hmm. think they have in common, these two together? <laughs> I, I, I keep thinking of... And I will yeah. be the first one to say yes. There's a very dramatic image of um, some uh, truncated torso and breasts. So I'll just put that out there. So. <laughs> yeah, we might get some oohs and ahs and hang ups. I'm kidding. Um, yeah. No, but, um, but seriously, but seriously, um, no, I, I can only, I mean, like the only, uh, what was your question again, Kedra? I'm so sorry. Was it what, what's, what they share? All in common between the two of them or why I might have, um, why these, I can go more into why these uh, are meaningful or have a connection to me, but just thinking about what your first impressions are when, when they come up for you. Totally. I mean, I, I only see like such extreme differences because I, I think when I see Beauty Revealed, um, mm -hmm. which is of the, the bare breasts that are interestingly wrapped in that fabric, which is really mm -hmm. fascinating. I think of, um, something like that's private, but that's being sort of carefully displayed. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think of the when I see this this portrait of Rose Prentice, I think of portraits as a real sort of public, you know, like what so what the the beauty revealed seems to be very private, 
mm -hmm. in its own way, what is being shown. And, and this is my first impressions. But this other uh, this other miniature of, of mm. um, Rose, this seems to be, you know, all about public presentation. Mm -hmm. so I only see personally. So you see the distinction between the public versus the private, um, and I think that that is absolutely one of the one of the distinctions. And between the two, also all, both presenting womanhood of a particular kind, but in very, very different ways. One seemingly meant for completely private consumption, one meant for public consumption. And um, I, it makes me think of, there was an anonymous comment that said, you know, women are objectified and the eyes asking you to see me, not as an ornament, but to see directly. Um, and then also that uh, what other body parts might work in that kind of framing. And so if we go right to Beauty Revealed, the reason I think that this connects very readily to our eye pin is that it offered, it also offered lovers the possibility of revealing their love only to their beloved. So this particular miniature is um, by uh, a well-known miniaturist named Sarah Goodrich, who sent it to her then lover, <laughs> Daniel Webster. Um, who was who became a well-known uh, political figure um, and a high-profile abolitionist, um, and uh, and she was his um, lover. And she didn't marry. Goodrich was a very interesting figure, even as a portraitist. So she never married. She resided with her family in Boston over the course of her life. But she was one of very few women to have her own portrait studio. And it seems that she only left Boston two times in her life, both times to see Webster, once when his first mm -hmm. wife died and the second time when he separated from his second. And so ultimately, Webster didn't even marry Sarah. He married someone wealthier with higher social standing. But this miniature was passed down through the Webster family, along with Sarah's painting tools. And his de descendants actually mm -hmm. referred to her as his fiance, right? So this way, this kind of secretive, secreted away love affair was represented in this way. And I think um, uh, someone mentioned before that maybe this was kind of like early Tinder, right? Sending one's fragmented body to someone else um, um, as a way of, you know, demonstrating, in this case, maybe what you've been missing or, or just a way of bearing oneself so completely mm -hmm. in a way that you could not um, in public. Um, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, there's some great there's some great comments. Grace um, has some a good question, or she she maybe is is thinking about the pair in a very different way, but also I think opposed idealized, objectified beauty versus reality, and she's wondering if those these two um, of Rose Prentice and Beauty Revealed are the same period or scale, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is interesting. I think they are the same scale, just one is yep. oriented differently. If I'm yes. correct. Yes, um, they they are both. Like three by four inches, and then four by three inches is 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 um, thereabouts, and that's absolutely true. I think that there is a way in which there, like the balance in beauty revealed, those are very 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 well proportioned <laughs> breasts, and then with Rose, the way that she <laughs> is dressed, the way that she's sitting. This is um, the thing about the image of Rose. In particular, is she's this image of a single black woman in a portrait miniature from this moment, and they are just they are around the same period. They're separated by about ten years, I believe. Beauty Revealed is around eighteen twenty one, and I think the other is anyway, it will come up. It's eighteen twenty eight, I think. I think. Sorry, the the dates are all jumbling in my mind. However. Um, <laughs> And also, I know that we are going to have to wrap this up pretty fast. But um, but that this uh, this image of Rose, there's only one other that I know of on record of a black woman alone in a portrait miniature. They show up otherwise as sort of props, sort of holding up white children or behind um, the family that either owned or employed them. So this was very distinct and also painted by Sarah Goodridge. And because I guess like on television, I um, am getting a little signal that I've got to start wrapping this up. I just want to make sure that we um, 
refer to a couple of these other uh, comments. Lastly, the, the intimacy of the object in each picture is very um, distinct. So mm -hmm. though Rose is presenting a public face, right, we're still rather close to her. The background is mm -hmm. rather empty so that she is centralized and in Beauty Revealed as well. I think we see a little bit of that um, with the way that it's surrounded in that cloth. And if we were to see this image of Rose in its case, it also has that kind of velvet nap around the mm -hmm. edge and it's in a leather their folding, folding cakes. Um, yeah, I, I really like that anonymous comment about the, um, the, the, the breasts and also Rose being sort of centered and this idea of the background sort of draping around her in a way, just like the, yes. um, that, that's how I'm, I'm, I'm reading them. I think that's a really um, a great way of, of drawing them together, right? And, and how our attention is centered um, on these very intimate private objects. It's so true. And I mean, I think that even in this short conversation that we've had, we can see how um, these few additional historical details can give us a whole new set of questions and connections um, uh, between the, our initial eye pin through the Louise, Louise Bourgeois eyes through these two paintings that we're looking at now. And I um, and we can continue this conversation. So like Desktop Dialogues, after this, we have a Zoom program, which I'll describe in a moment. But before that, um, I want to ask our audience, what is the most important or interesting thing that you've learned in this session? We really want to take these sessions and think about how we um, uh, listen to you and what it is that you would like to, to learn most. So what you'll see in the Q&A is the question, what is the most important or interesting thing that you learned? And then you will see a list of possibilities, um, either new ways to describe what I see, new questions to ask when I approach an artwork, some surprising historical connections, or some other um, uh, detail that you found most interesting. And then you can just hit the thumbs up button. Um, uh, they will be posted in the Q&A right now. There we are. And you just hit the like button on the one that most applies to yours. And if it's other, please put, the, put in the comments what that other thing was. So over the course of this program, we just asked some sort of basic questions and then based on our expertise as both our historians and museum educators, we were driven towards some particular kinds of questions. But um, the, the sort of conversation will continue around how we're looking at the collection at the museum and what are new entry points. And to that end, Andrew, do, could you tell us what's happening in Desktop Dialogues next week? Yeah, um, I'd love to invite everybody to Desktop Dialogues next week. It's uh, Wednesday, August 19th at noon, and we will uh, be discussing uh, care and curatorial practice uh, in conversation with Latanya Autry, who is the Gun Curatorial Fellow at uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art Cleveland. Um, uh, Latanya has an exhibition up there and has also has been kind of um, uh, curating in this sort of more audience-centered way for a few years and will be sharing some of her knowledge. And she'll also be joining, I think, Kijo the week after that for Close Looking. So it should be a lot of fun. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and so before we close, this is just a reminder that we'll be keeping this conversation going in Zoom for the next 30 minutes. The link is in the Q&A. And there we can delve more deeply into these artworks or, and we can try to respond to more of your questions and comments. If you haven't already, please respond to the poll and then we can head on over to Zoom. But before we go completely, I just wanna make sure that we acknowledge the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, whose funding is making both of these programs, Desktop Dialogues and Close Looking at a Distance possible. I just want to take a moment to thank you, Andrew, for joining me today. This has been great fun for the last couple of weeks. Um, and to thank all of the audience members who were able to join us. And I hope that we'll see you over on Zoom. Thank you, Kijo. It's been great. And I'll, we'll continue the conversation. Great. Thanks, everyone.